Welcome to Meet the Leader. This is part two of our conversation with the former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki. Enjoy watching. Every leader in the world experienced moment of difficulty, and I, I believe uh, you are no exception. Can you recall any specific crisis that, um, in your leadership that uh, stand as um, a moment that really tested you, and what lessons can be drawn out of that crisis? Well, I, I don't know. I think maybe uh, um, uh, in 2005 we, uh, we had to take a decision uh, about uh, the then uh, deputy president uh, of the ANC and deputy president of the country, the current president yeah. Yeah, uh, of Zuma. South Africa, President Jacob Zuma, because there had been a court case uh, it did involve, it was a court case about corruption. And uh, in the remarks that the judge made um, in concluding that case, uh, Jacob Zuma himself was not on trial, but in the remarks that he made, mm. the, the, the judge said, uh, I'm not quoting him directly, mm. but that uh, indeed uh, Jacob Zuma had been involved in corrupt practice with together with this person that was sentenced to 15 years or something. So the challenge therefore that we faced was that here we are as a country, we have a, a constitution which says uh, separation of powers, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary and so on. And we as a government have to respect the decisions of the judiciary. Uh, and so this challenge arose as to what do we do? Uh, so in the end, we said, look, we, in order to sustain that as a government, we are the government and we cannot be the first people to ignore what the courts are saying. We, we've got to show an example by respecting what the courts say. Therefore, in that context, uh, it's better that, uh, that uh, we should relieve him of his responsibilities in government. It was not easy. It was difficult. It's not as though he had himself been put on trial and been found guilty, which would then become a straightforward case. But it was this, uh, this uh, determination made by this judge, which obviously then has a public impact. Uh, and, and as I say, we, sought, we thought that as government, we, have the, we must have the first responsibility to respect this constitutional setup and, and therefore respect what, what the courts are saying. So we acted like that. It was not very easy because this is the, the deputy president of the country. And, but of course, uh, later, uh, those charges were dropped uh, against him. Um, but it, was, uh, it's not, it can't be an easy moment that uh, you have to, to say to the deputy president of the republic, look, uh, it's better that you step down and let, let, let's wait until the courts sort out this matter in the finality. That, that, that was a difficult moment. Okay. Uh, Your Excellency, you are the architect of uh, New Economic Partnership for Africa, NEPAT, which actually is a um, social economic framework for Africa uh, economic growth, which was adopted uh, 2001. Now we are about 10 years past that initiative. I, in your view, has NEPAD met uh, its objective, and, and what are some of the leadership lessons that can be drawn out of that? I think in terms of uh, <clears throat> putting on the table, on the African table, this development perspective, yeah. uh, to say to all of us as, as a continent, uh, yeah. look, th these are the things that we must do. Yeah. I think it, it made a big contribution in terms of, therefore, putting into, all our, into our common thinking a perspective uh, about the African continent, which perspective remains to this day. Uh, I think the, the major challenge, well, let me say, one of the, uh, uh, the principal implementation uh, agencies uh, for this, it was con they were conceived of as your, the regions, the regional economic communities, that would build towards this implementation of this all Africa policy program from below, as it were. 
So the regions become important. So when you talk about increasing African trade, for instance, uh, let's build a regional partnership to increase our capacity to trade. Uh, then you've got to go to the region and say, well, what's, what can we do in the region to achieve this? I think it's, it's that implementation uh, stage where uh, I, th I think we have not moved as fast as we should. It raises a larger question. It raises a larger question about uh, what we do in order to implement policies that we've agreed, we've, we've agreed to. So um, if you say, for instance, we, uh, uh, we, we must build this partnership, um, first of all among ourselves as Africans, to achieve this development in socioeconomic uh, goals, uh, and say, uh, what, what resources do we have in this region of our own that we can put together to build infrastructure so that people can move up and down and, and, and all of that? Again, you run into problems um, about the capacity to, to generate those sorts of resources as a region. So I, I would say that uh, um, that's really been the, the, the challenge with regard to, to NAPAD. When we've said, for instance, we've, we've agreed on all of these various programs uh, to implement whether it's agriculture or industry or development of universities and, and so on, um, let's let's uh, let's then find the resources among ourselves to do that. Uh, it becomes difficult, mm -hmm. and at a certain stage, when we said uh, a number of our countries have got pension funds, uh, why don't we take some of these pension funds to use as Africa's own capital to invest in the programs uh, that we've agreed? again, you find you're not getting the sort of response that you, you would expect. Partly because uh, uh, you have uh, some of these pension funds invested uh, outside of the continent, or on the basis that uh, the risk, the risk in, on the continent is, is too high. So better invest in other low-risk countries because, after all, this is pensioners' money. Mm. Um, so I'm saying that you have uh, challenges, mm. challenges of that kind of, uh, of, of, of the implementation of, of, of NEPAD. Mm. And even, uh, uh, you're quite right, you mind, it's a socio-economic program, so one of the issues that was raised in NEPAD was that you need to create the right conditions for development to take place. So, for instance, we therefore have to address this matter of peace. So, uh, as NEPAD, we then had a lot of interaction with the rest of the world on the peace question. Uh, now you have a situation to this day that uh, our continent cannot finance its own peace operations. Uh, we say that uh, here is a problem now uh, in the Eastern Congo, um, surely the African continent wants this problem solved. But I'm quite sure if they said uh, tomorrow, no, let us send a battalion there, the money to finance that operation will come from outside of the continent. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that uh, this is a, a particular challenge. There's another problem uh, that's arisen. We uh, <coughs> We said this is a partnership among ourselves as Africans, first of all, so let's see what we do among ourselves. But it's also a partnership between Africa and the rest of the world. And indeed, we then engage the rest of the world to say now, we, we want that you, the rest of the world, must construct your relationship with the continent on, the base, on this basis, on the basis of what we as Africans have decided. So uh, indeed, it was agreed. So, for instance, the, uh, the G8 uh, adopted what uh, they call the G8 Africa Action Plan, mm -hmm. uh, which was based on their part. They said, all right, we accept your proposal that from now onwards, we will behave on the continent within the context of what the continent itself has decided. 
And then they worked out the G8 Africa action plan on that basis. But over time, they made a commitment with regard to all of these various elements. This is what we'll do and so on. And we we'll set up joint institutions to make sure that we monitor and evaluate what has been done and all that. But over time, they, they moved away uh, with the result that to, today, that G8 Africa Action Plan has disappeared. So the base that had been established of cooperation between Africa and the developed world in particular, in terms of these economic relations, I'm saying it's disappeared <laughs> because these developed countries moved away from it. So the basis for that partnership got eroded uh, over time. So these would be some of the challenges that we need to, that we face with regard to NAPAD, which the, our leadership on the continent must continue to address. There's a feeling that um, Africa is marginalized at an international stage. To take the case of Libya, for example, I, I'm not sure whether what we see in Libya today was uh, an ideal condition that uh, Africa Union had wanted. Um, Obviously, maybe NATO ignored uh, AU uh, recommendation then. To, to what extent you think Africa uh, need to do to bring back its relevance on the international stage? Leadership response. I think the, uh, <coughs> the, 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 the Libyan experience, yeah. um, and I think you are quite correct to refer to it, uh, I think the, what, the, what really needs to happen is that our leadership on the continent needs seriously to sit down to assess that, to say what happened and why. Because clearly, uh, as you know, uh, the, the African Union had taken certain decisions uh, about Libya, yeah. about how to solve this problem. They had engaged uh, the late Colonel Gaddafi to say, as the African Union, this is what we're going to do to assist you people to solve the problem. And Gaddafi had agreed. Uh, then uh, the African Union consulted and communicated that to the Security Council to say, as a continent, this is what we're going to do. And the Security Council completely ignored what, what the continent had said and took their own decisions, which resulted in this intervention by NATO and, and so on. Uh, so I'm saying that, you see, I think it would be important for the continent to sit down and say what went wrong. What, what is it? Uh, that emboldened, that emboldened uh, even the Security Council to go against a decision formally taken by the African Union. And I think in terms of making that assessment, probably what uh, one of the conclusions that we probably would reach is that uh, we need to strengthen the sense of cohesion uh, on the continent. We need to act together in unity. Because you'll remember that what happened is that despite the fact that the African Union had taken the positions that it took on Libya, individual African countries broke away, as it were, and began to say their own things, uh, consistent with what Western countries were saying about Libya. And maybe that's what then encourages uh, uh, people to intervene on the continent when we are not united ourselves behind positions that we take. But I'm saying that I think it would be important for, for our leadership really to sit down and assess what happened. Because we, uh, we had warned that, uh, first of all, that we had agreed with the government of Libya, the AU had agreed with the government of Libya that indeed change was needed that it was absolutely necessary to have a, a process of democratization take place, that it was important that uh, the government of Libya should engage with the rebellion that had broken out, uh, stop the shooting, and let people sit down, and the, the AU was ready to facilitate all of that, and matter was agreed, but nevertheless, I say the Security Council decided in its own thing. Uh, and the continent had foreseen that if you handle this thing in a particular way, in the way that it was actually handled, mm -hmm. it would produce uh, other consequences. So that today, you have a Libya which is very unstable. Mm -hmm. But also, you then have the consequences in Mali. Mm -hmm. 
again in the continent that said this, that you see, if you handle the matter in the way it was, that, that was handled, one of the negative consequences would be the destabilization of the whole region, and particularly the Sahel. That was foreseen, and it was said. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm saying that for the continent to sit down and say, what went wrong? Why was this thing handled like this? And therefore, to the extent that what happened is as a result of our own weaknesses, to address this matter as to let's identify those weaknesses and correct them. Because if we don't, we will have another operation of this kind in a, in a situation in which the West, because of our weaknesses, feels emboldened to intervene on the continent in the way that it likes. But it is critical uh, that, that as, as Africans, we really sit down and discuss this matter frankly. You, you ran for uh, ANC president for the third time. You, you attempted for the third time in 2007, and uh, you, you lost to, to President Zuma as a president of ANC. But you, you accepted the result, and uh, you moved on graciously. Um, this is not very common in African politics. What can you share with uh, existing and upcoming leaders on the need to accept the results and move on and assist your country to move on? I think that, of course, I, I mean, one, I think one of the things that is very critical in this matter is uh, it, it's a reflection on uh, uh, the nature of one's political commitment. Yes. Uh, it, it is important that as African leaders, we must bear in mind that uh, we are elected into these positions not to serve our own individual interests but elected into these positions to, in order to serve the people. So uh, you must, faced with a situation like that, uh, you've got to answer the question, what do I do that is correct, mm -hmm. that would serve the interest of the country? No, not uh, what do I do which serves my interests. Mm -hmm. But if, I think if, if you don't have that kind of political understanding, that kind of political commitment, that you are here as a servant of the people, then you'll get into this problem. When it's time to go, because you are serving yourself, you will resist to go, because you are not there to, to, to serve the people. And I think that is critical. The time is running out. Maybe that's question, uh, Your Excellency. Which leader in the world inspired you most, or inspires you most? I mean, whether he's deceased or she's deceased, or he or she's still with us? <laughs> well, I <clears throat> no, I, I think that you would have to uh, you'd, you'd have to talk about a number of leaders. Maybe I give you two. You, would, uh, you have to talk about a number <laughs> of leaders. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, if you take, for instance, one of the people who influenced us, influenced us greatly mm -hmm. in terms of our thinking about many things, would be would be the late uh, Julius Nyerere. Uh, very wise, very well grounded, but also very commitment to service, to serve the people and to serve the continent. And many of the things that he said uh, are things that we would repeat today as, as being important. The second? There would, I mean, there would be, there would be others. Uh, uh, you see, we, uh, <clears throat> uh, during the uh, long period of this time in, in, in exile, uh, we, we, we worked out of Zambia. And, uh, um, and to look at the, uh, the way the Zambians approached the matter of their contribution to the liberation of Southern Africa, uh, and the readiness, and the readiness really to sacrifice everything to achieve this objective. So President Kaunda would be, would be one of these people, but there are many. Ah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Viewers, thank you very much for tuning in. I'm sure you have uh, learnt a lot from the experience of the former President of the Republic of South Africa, His Excellency Tabo Mbeki. Your Excellency, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.